I'm going to disarm them, and then you'll engage. Punch them. Come on, Barbie. Let's go party. The Flash, the Scarlet Speedster, the fastest man alive. Created in 1940, he appeared in countless comics, two separate live-action TV shows, and has evolved into the patron saint of little kids who love to run. And yet, the one thing that's always eluded the Scarlet Speedster is a feature film. Tragically, the recently released filmic debut was less a celebration paying tribute to 80 years of the character and more an attempt to resurrect the dead on multiple fronts. You should seek the services of a mental health professional. The Justice League is not very good at that part yet. Trust me. Before we find ourselves slipping into the Speed Force, please be sure to like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic for more superhero videos just like this. And also be warned, this video will have major spoilers in it. The road to getting the Flash on the big screen was long and laborious. That feels like an oversimplification. There were iterations of Central City's finest going all the way back to the 90s. However, the most recent permutations were all centered around Ezra Miller's bafflingly weird and distinctly awkward version of Barry Allen. Abrasion resistant, heat resistant. Uh, yeah, I do competitive ice dancing. It's what they use on the space shuttle to prevent it from burning up on re-entry. I do very competitive ice dancing. There was the Lord and Miller version, the Rick Famuyiwa version, and then the attempt that was written by God-tier comic book writer Grant Morrison and Ezra Miller themselves in just two short weeks. However, the version we got was much less a Flash origin story and more a simultaneous swan song for the DCEU and an attempted corporate rebirth, intended as a potential rewriting of the universe, which coincidentally lined up with James Gunn and Peter Safran taking over as the new heads of DC Studios, the film had a very large role to play in the prospective future of this DC universe. These worlds are colliding and collapsing. We did this. The film sees Barry Allen traveling back in time in order to try and find a way to rewrite history and save his mother's life. What he doesn't expect is that this will alter the course of time itself and create an almost infinite number of problems. And yet there's one problem with the movie that feels like it bleeds across the line from the cinematic happenings of The Flash and encroaches on our world. There was just no way to recover from that. Just let it go. I'd really love to stay and clean up more mess, but this little superhero needs his breakfast. Goodbye, Flash. During the third act of The Flash, Barry Allen and his new BFF 18-year-old Barry Allen enter a time bubble and witness countless alternate realities. So what, are we gonna get the Grant Gustin version of the character? Maybe the John Wesley Ship version from the 90s? How about Michael Rosenbaum's Wally West from the Bruce Timm animated show? We're supposed to be conducting an investigation. Can I help it if I have a hyper-accelerated metabolism? Besides, it's just a little snack. No? We're getting Superman and Batman cameos, but not Henry Cavill or Brandon Routh or Christian Bale. We're getting George Reeves, the Superman from the 1950s TV show. Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a tree! It's Superman! Huh. Feels a little disrespectful bringing back a dead person to play this iconic character again. Oh, and then we're doing another cameo of Superman, and it's Christopher Reeve, and de-aged Helen Slater, and Nick Cage as Superman, and an Adam West Batman. If you're trying to spike a bit of nostalgia in your $200 million superhero story, this is the way to do it. There's only one problem. These people are no longer alive. Well, with the exception of Nick Cage and Helen Slater, but you get the idea. The whole thesis of The Flash is that Barry needs to learn the lesson that sometimes there are situations that are just unwinnable. There are circumstances that you can't find a way to bargain with, so all you can do is accept the tragedy of those moments. This isn't even subtext to the story. During one scene, his mother literally says, Not every problem has a solution. Sometimes you just have to let go. The act of digitally resurrecting George Reeves, Christopher Reeve, and Adam West feels as if it flies in the face of what this movie is literally about. It works counter to the expressed mission statement of the piece. Nobody dies! Barry. Not every problem has a solution. And to make it even weirder, these were just the ones that actually made it to the screen. When talking to Vanity Fair, director Andy Muschietti revealed that there was a whole laundry list of other actors who were planned but were ultimately scrapped. Marlon Brando's Jarrell, Cesar Romero's Joker, and Burgess Meredith's Penguin, just to name a few. Again, according to the director, the existing cameos that were included in the film were all done above board and with permissions. When talking to Games Radar, Muschietti said, as long as they were DC characters, everything was allowed. I made a list of superheroes that I love that I would love to see, and it was a long list. This just begs a simple question. 
who is allowing this? George Reeves died possibly by a self-inflicted wound or maybe in an altercation with studio fixer Eddie Mannix in 1959. Accounts and opinions vary. Reeves led a conflicted life post his turn at Superman and felt that he was trapped by the role. There's many dissenting accounts on if he did in fact end his own life, but what is a commonly accepted fact is that he struggled with his relationship to the Man of Steel. Christopher Reeve died in 2004 and Adam West in 2017. Who is giving permission for these actors' likenesses to be used? You might be saying to yourself that Christopher Reeve would have probably loved to see himself up on the big screen in all his glory, considering the tragedy that befell him later in life. An old interview clip of him expressing the exact opposite is actually true. What the majors do is you take what grossed 100 million domestically last year and get the key ingredients back again and try to pump it up a few more times. Yeah. Of course, the, the, the quality is a sliding scale of diminishing returns. Yeah, kind of sounds like he probably wouldn't have wanted his likeness to be used this way, doesn't it? To add an even more confusing element to the story, The Flash features a version of Jay Garrick's Silver Age Flash. The big screen version of the character looks a hell of a lot like the version of the character portrayed on the CW speedster TV show by actor Teddy Sears. When asked if he had shot a cameo for the film, Sears responded, People kept telling me that I was in the new Flash movie, but I'm pretty sure I would have remembered shooting a major DC Studios film. Scary, isn't it? But here's the question at hand. Where do we draw the line? Where does it become immoral to resurrect these great icons of cinema and have them turned into digital marionettes for a cooing infantilized audience of people who just want a moment's respite from the difficulties of existence? Barry, this is inevitable. We can try a million times and we're not going to be able to fix this. No matter what we do, this world dies. How do we parse the simple fact that life's impermanence is the very thing that gives it meaning? Collectively, as a culture, we seem to be processing the grief and trauma over the past few years through the growing trend of multiverse movies. We all seem to be suspended in a life ruled by what-ifs or what could have happened. And these decrepit computer animated confections are the perfect example of how deeply our culture is yearning for pasts and futures that never were. However, the most disturbing aspect of this trend is that with the advent of the rapidly evolving artificial intelligence landscape, we are definitely looking down the barrel of more. This isn't a one-off, oh, that was in poor taste overstepping of a movie studio. This is going to be the future. They want to reach their hand into the, into the till again and, and, and come up with a fistful of gold, and they don't always want to put out what it, what it takes to make the quality. It's literally only a matter of time before we get massive blockbusters starring de-aged and digitally resurrected icons from cinematic eras past. Pre-order your tickets to Superman, the soon-to-be-announced reboot starring a digitally necromancied Christopher Reeve, a film that feels eerily familiar and laced with a milky sense of deja vu. Turn off your phone and just stop thinking. Let go of mom? She'll always be alive somewhere in time. Always. It's not for us. And well, that's all we have for this week. What do you think? Are we heading toward the cultural end times or will CGI death masks of celebrities soon be looked back on as the Furbies of the 2020s? Let us know down in the comments below. And as always, please be sure to like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic for more videos just like this.